throughout my history He's been faithful Your faithfulness is walked beside me The winter storms made a way for spring And every season from where I'm standing Remember when I'm weak That fear may come But fear will leave Yes it will You lead my heart To victory You are my strength And you always will be I see the evidence of your good is calling 
Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, we'll come to the altar. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord uh, as we wrap up this uh, series that we're doing on I'm a believer. What is it to be a believer? What is it to to be able to say that I, I believe? I know a lot of times we just think of it as, well, I went to the altar, I asked God to forgive me. But we've talked about the fact that there are four different areas in which I have to establish my life so that I can be a believer, so that I can actually say that I am a believer. And so let's go to some of our scriptures we've used as, as our backdrop to some of this as we've built this. And we've covered three. This will be our fourth one, our final part, fifth message on this. So in John 10 and 10, and in Hebrews 11 and 6, let's pull these up. 
The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So we've realized that there's an enemy out there, that his job is very simple. It's to rob us, to steal from us. And when we see that, we think of it more in the physical way. We think of, well, he's trying to kill us and steal from us. And No, it's from the spiritual side which he operates, in which he is robbing us of our identity, of our confidence, of the things that we need to be able to be the productive Christian that we want to be. Many people will spend most of their life struggling with their relationship with God. Does God hear my prayers? Does God love me? Does God, did God fully forgive me, or is he just paying me back for some of the stuff I've done? And they'll go through all of these scenarios. Isn't it amazing that when things go wrong, what do we think of? Our past. As soon as we start going through something, we're like, well, I guess I had this coming. I guess this is... Why? Because the enemy plays from that area. He plays from what we've done, from what we've said, actions we've had. So he's coming to rob us and steal and kill the things that we're supposed to have. Listen to Hebrews 11 and 6. When we begin to build this relationship, listen, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that what? He is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This is the opposite side. The opposite side of sitting there being robbed and being uh, stolen from is the mindset that I have faith, which is a thought that I'm in going into my future. And so since I'm going into my future, how do I do that? Well, if I do that, if I'm going to have faith for the impossible, the things that I want to see, then listen, I first must believe that he is. I've got to establish that a relationship and that I've got to believe that his goal, his purpose is to reward me. The whole purpose of me living today is so that God can reward my life with something more than it has. Jesus said what? That I've come that you might have a decent life. No, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Paul would later, or that writer of Hebrews would say it the same way. God has come that you would seek him. Why? So that he can reward you, so that he can give you more into your future than you have now. Now, when we begin this, we understand this through several stories through the Bible. Go with me to Mark 9 and 23, as we're just kind of rehearsing some of the things we've talked about of what it is to I'm a believer. And here's what Jesus said to one man who was needing prayer for his son. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. This man comes to Jesus and says, I had your disciples pray, they couldn't heal. And Jesus looks at him and says, you know what? If you can believe, all things. Now, I want you to notice the, 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 the deal here. The word God is never used. Read it very carefully. The word God is never used. If you believe in God, anything's possible to those who believe in God. That's not what he said, is it? He said, if you can believe. Remember in Genesis, in the Tower of Babel, where, where the people are coming together and they're going to build this giant tower and they're going to reach heaven and reach God and, and, and had this crazy thought. It was, it was ridiculous. But the fact is, here's what God said about it. He said, we've got to distort their, their language. We've got to, to separate them. Why? Because listen, when they put their mind to it, there's nothing impossible to them who put their mind to it that, that we can't stop. Why? Because we were built to be believers. We were built to be people whom God could seek out and find who can believe for things even though they can't see it and even though they haven't experienced it, they can believe that it's there. That's what separates us from every other creature that's ever been created. That when God gave us a piece of himself, you can believe that your future will be better. You can believe that your family will one day get saved. You can believe that your life will go forward. You have built within you the ability to believe. The enemy knows that. The enemy knows that inside of you is the most powerful piece. It's called faith. To all has been given a measure of faith, a measure of being able to believe that God wants to do something beyond where you are right now. The only reason I got up this morning is because I believe God's got something better for me in my future. Now, this believing, listen, comes out in every area of our life then. What we believe eventually affects every area. Let me show you. 
It affects your attitude. It affects your at- what we say, the gestures we make. If I say, man, we can do it. Yeah, right. What's that? Doesn't that frustrate you? As parents, you can do this. No. You just want to pop them. It's like, what are you doing? Why? Because see, what it is, you're trying to get them to understand that if you can believe it, you can do it. It comes out in, in, in what we say. It comes out in our gestures. In fact, one of the worst things that we do to people is this. We tell them, and maybe you've heard this phrase, son, you need to change your attitude. You need to change your attitude. See, the only problem with that is that's a false statement. Attitude changes because of what I believe. So what we teach people is to fake an attitude. We teach our children to fake their attitude. We're not changing what they believe, and since we don't attack what they believe, we tell, look, you need to fix your attitude. And so what do we learn? That when I'm around certain people, I act a certain way. When I'm in church, I act like I'm a believer. Praise God, I believe in God. And then when I leave church, I don't believe that junk. I don't, you know, you believe that stuff? Well, you know, it's kind of, why? Because, because I've learned to be whatever I need to do. I've learned to change my attitude. But really, an attitude never truly changes until what it believes changes. And when that changes, it goes to the root of who you are. It changes your gestures. It changes what comes out of your mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Listen, number two, it changes your awareness of what's going on around. When when all of a sudden I become a believer, then all of a sudden what I see around me, what I expect to happen around me, totally changes. I can start believing for bigger things, better things, wonderful things. As soon as I begin to believe, it starts to affect my attitude, my awareness of what's going on. Someone who hasn't had this, when things start happening, what do they say? Well, you know, what, what always happens. Well, you know it ain't going to work out. Why? Because their awareness is seeing all the negative and they're expecting something bad. What you believe affects every area of your life. You don't realize, you're like, well, that's just who I am. No, it's what you believe. And until you change your belief, it doesn't change attitude, awareness. It won't change your actions. It won't change what you do. You won't stick with something you don't believe. You might do something for a little while because somebody told you to or told you it would work, but you won't stick with anything that you truly don't believe will work. You won't stick with church if you don't believe it's not going to work. You may come every other week. You may come once a month. You may come in for a month or two and then fall out for a month or two. Why? Because you really don't believe it. Don't shout me down. You've got to change what you believe. You've got to establish that I am a believer. It changes actions. And f- fourth, it changes your altitude. What's eventually going to happen in your life, the results of your life is going to be determined by what you believe. You're not going to go any further than what you believe. You can't. You can't rise above it. So the enemy, when he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, what is he after? What you believe. That's all he's after. He knows I don't have to, to, to hurt you in some physical way. I don't have to get you to rob a bank. I don't need to get, because you'll rob the bank if you don't believe there's any other way for you to ever be successful in life. You'll eventually go rob something, steal something, do why? Because what you believe will eventually affect every area of your life. So when we started this, we understood that there are four plateaus, four blocks that we need to have foundationally established. Number one, we dealt with that trust. We've got to learn to trust in the God full of grace and mercy. We call them the wonder twins, remember? Grace and mercy. We, we've got to first come to God and understand that it's God who's doing the work, that it's God who has the plan for our life. It, it's not something we've dreamed up or thought up. This is God initiated. For Jesus said, I have come Not you. You didn't come to me. I came so that you might have life. I did it. So I came with grace, but I made mistakes. That's where grace and mercy comes in. Grace is doing what? Giving you what? What you don't deserve. Mercy is not giving you what you do deserve. Remember? 
Mercy is not giving you what you, if you did something, it's like, I'm going to show mercy. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. That's mercy. And then you're like, well, at least I got to go free. And then he says, but I'm going to give you grace. Well, what's grace? Grace is to give you more than what you deserve. So when grace and mercy enters your life, it all of a sudden establishes us, not of our own power, not of our own ability, but of God. Now, I've done preached all this. I'm trying to get through it, trying to, trying to get through all this. So number two, we, far, we found out that we have to trust and believe in yourself and the things that you can do. God, when he made you, did not make you as a piece of junk. We read all the scriptures of how you were marvelously made, formed. God knew your parts before he put them together. You, you are all of that. God loves you. And we use the jokingly, you know, in a way, I, I use that joking all the time, like, you know, I can't help it. I'm just one good looking dude. And I use that jokingly, and I don't want people to think that. I, but what I'm saying is, if I'm not good looking, then what am I? If you're not smart, then what are you? If you're not intelligent, then what are you? See, the enemy just needs you to have a belief. If he can say, you're ugly and dumb and stupid, then he don't have to do anything else. He can just stand back and say, ugly, dumb, and stupid, going to take care of themselves. But if he bumps into me that says, man, I am one good-looking thing God made. I'm telling you what, anything I'm lacking wisdom-wise, the Bible says all I have to do is ask and it shall be given to me. Any, anything I need to know, anything I need to understand, I'm telling you, I'm a walking computer. Anything I ever need from God, God said ask and it will be given. All of a sudden now, I become an enemy to him. He's like, whoa now, you, you could be dangerous. Oh, ugly and dumb over there, he ain't causing me no problem, but you good looking and smart, you causing me issues. If you're picking a team, would you pick yourself first? I would. I want to win. I'd pick Tim Lott first. If you want to win, if you want to play basketball, pick me first. You can't even play the best. Yeah, but I'm, I got to bring all these attributes. I'm going to try it. I'm going to hustle. And I'm going to fight for it. I'm going to... I know the qualities that I have. Do you know the qualities that God has given you? The abilities, the talents. You, yours may be different than somebody else, but you are marvelously made. Not everybody can sing. Not everybody can build. Not everybody can draw. Not everybody, but everybody in here has been marvelously made. Some have great attitudes. Some have great abilities to communicate. Some don't like talking at all. It doesn't make one better than the other. It just means that you have to realize God made me and He didn't make me wrong. I just need to work at, and then what makes life really good is when you know what you're good at, and then you begin to work at the things you're not good at and add to your life. Last week we learned finally that I've learned to trust in the ones God has placed around me. So if, if I learn to trust in God, I learn to trust in myself, and I learn then to trust in those around me whom God has put around me. I always say it this way. I said, if the enemy wants to stop you, he's going to send a person. And if God wants to bless you, he's going to send a person. You know what your job in life is? Pick the right person. That's your job. You, you, don't, you don't have to be super intelligent. You don't, you don't have to, remember I said, whatever I'm lacking, I, 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 can, I can have, I, I know it. Why? Because I, I know who I am. I know God has blessed me. So here's the way it works. Okay, I don't, I don't have certain abilities. Well, that's simple. I have a pastor's counsel. And on that, I have a banker. I have people who can build. I have people who can do this, do that, do that. I don't have to be smart. Because I got somebody educated in all these different fields in my life and I've got oh, multiple people I can call on the phone, Kenneth, whoever else I want to call, Kenneth, tell me about this. If I try to build this, explain this to me, explain this to me. If, if I need to know about something, I need, if I want to know about Oakdale, or anything, I can call uh, uh, Linda and I can say, Linda, tell me what's going on. Why? Because I don't have to know it. I realize God has put people in my life. Who are the people in your life? Are they making it better? Worse? What are they doing? The enemy sent you some. God sent you some. Your job is to pick the right ones. 
So today, number four, it's the last one, last pillar, is that I have to trust in the promises of God completely. I have to eventually, this is, this is the height of my relationship, number four, I have to trust in the promises of God completely. How do I know I trust in the promises of God completely? Here's the way I put it. Where defeat becomes uncommon and unexpected. How do I know that I believed in the promises of God completely? That if something goes wrong, that's, that's unexpected to me. To where if something gets beaten back, I lose. That's unexpected to me. That, I, I, it's uncommon for me to lose. I'm used to winning. I'm used to moving forward. I'm used to overcoming. And if something comes against me that causes me not to overcome or causes me not to win, if I had time, we would go into Joshua's story and, and Joshua who had already defeated Jericho and Joshua who's walking, we can do it. Remember, he's 40 years ago. We can go in here with pitchforks. We can do it. We can take the land. We can, and, and he defeats Jericho. God pushes the walls down. It's an incredible thing. And the very next city is this little old bitty city of Ai. Just, just I. And, and he walks up to it. And he says, just send some guys and knock this thing out. And they come running back saying, we got beat. It, it just throws Joshua in a tizzy like, what in the world? What in the world? What it, we're not supposed to. Why? Because it's uncommon. It's unexpected. I expect to win every time. In fact, it sent Joshua on a scavenger hunt to find out why they were losing. And when he finally found it, they took care of the problem and went right back to winning again. Do you believe God's word so much that it's uncommon for you to lose? That's un it's unexpected for you to lose. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if I can't, something's wrong. Not with his word, something's wrong with me. So, so all of a sudden this morning, we need to find this final piece. Go with me in your Bible to Acts 13 and 22. David is our main character and there's something said about David in Acts uh, 13 and 22. He was called a man after God's own heart. In fact, three different times in the Bible, 2 Samuel and others, he's called a man after God's own heart. Now that's a powerful statement. But what does it really mean? Well, let's look at it. And when he had removed him, meaning Saul, as king, he raised up for them David as king to whom also he gave a testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. But he gives you the reason the very next part of that scripture. What does it say? Of whom will do all my will. Why did he pick David over everybody else? Because of his size, his strength? No. Here was David's characteristic that caused him to excel even in the midst of all of his life. Was that when David knew what God had spoken about something, when David grabbed hold of what God had spoken about anything, he was confident. So much so he would go face a giant confident. So much so that he would take a thousand and go fight ten thousand confident. So much so that he knew that that city which he was supposed to conquer become hated because it's not the way God wants it to be. And I'm going to climb the top and we're going to get over it. And we're going. David was a man after God's own heart because whatever God had spoken, it became true to David. Listen. David was not a man without problems or situations. David spent most of his life running and trying to get away and trying to escape. In fact, listen, Saul tried to kill him, the king before, multiple times. Even after he done brought him into his family and gave him his daughter to be his wife and he's a prince, he still would throw spears at him at, at, at dinner time. I mean, this guy, it was like he lived his whole life running. He would hide out and, uh, and his brother-in-law, Jonathan, would have to shoot an arrow and go out and show him whether you could come back home or not. Saul was in a, chased him down, hit him in caves, and if it hadn't been for the miracles of God two or three occasions, Saul would have killed him. Abner, who was the captain of the guard, when finally Saul is gone, you would think, finally, Saul is dead, we can get to, but Abner was Saul's uncle. 
And he tried to raise up other kings to to take the place of, uh, of David. He was always, until his death, he was against David. Huh. One night stands with Bathsheba. That was a mistake. She became pregnant. That's a big mistake. He ordered the death of her husband. That's a really major, colossal mistake. He he had enormous problems. From that issue, he had the death of his own infant son who lived about seven days and died. His daughter was raped by her own brother. Oh, but the family's so messed up. I know we think our families are messed up. David, well, man, David had it together. David's a man after God's own heart. Well, Amron got his, who did the raping, because Absalom called a meeting and killed him. Absalom decided, I need to be the king, overthrew David's kingdom, and would would have totally killed his own father and done everything he could except God intervened. That's why in Psalms 27, that's when that psalm is written, the psalm we've been kind of using. The first six verses is David coming back into the kingdom and thanking God that none of his enemies were able to overthrow him, that he was able to be put back on the throne, that he was overcomer. But the second six verses are his pain because remember Absalom trying to escape, one thing he had was some beautiful long hair. And he was trying to get through these trees and it got caught up in the trees and the horse ran out from under him and he's hanging by his hair. And one of David's captains said, this dude does not need to be hanging around. And even though David said, don't kill the boy, he killed him. So the second six verses is David saying, all this pain. Even though the first six verses are all about my victories, because, because that's what God's intending for us to overcome, to be. But at the same time, in the middle of life, there's all these moments of pain. Anybody ever have to live with both of them at the same time? Maybe you just have the good. I, I, I don't get just the good. I get the mixture. I get the miracle. Then I get the person that passes away that like, what in the world? I get the one that's healed and the one that doesn't get healed. I'm like, God. David says, listen to me. Yes, it's wonderful that I'm back, but it's my son is dead. It took an enormous price. And that's when we get to Psalms 27, the verses we've been using, 13 and 14. Now, let's read them again. This is what it says. I would have lost heart. I would have lost heart unless I had done what? Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land. David said, you know what gets me up in the morning? Yeah, I've lost my son. My daughter's been raped. Yeah, I've I killed a man years ago. Yeah, I've been through all these issues. Yes, yes, I've done, I've done things I'm ashamed of. But you me tell you what gets me up in the morning and moves me forward? He said, let me tell you what it is. He said, I would have gone crazy. I would have lost my mind if I would have sat there with the enemy, him telling me about my past and telling me all the crazy things I did and how I was no good and how I was born in this and how I was raised in this and uh, my life won't ever amount to anything because so and so said so 20 years ago if I'd have lived in that I would have gone crazy in my mind he said but listen to me I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living he understood grace and mercy he understood that I have value that my days aren't done he understood that God will surround me with everybody that I need to move forward again and he understood the promises of God listen to verse 14 Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on who? Who's His confidence in? God. He said, listen to me, God won't fail you. God won't come up short. God won't miss it. God won't mess it up. So David trusted the promises of God completely. Go with me to Psalms 119. This is one of... And if I, I'm not going to teach this psalm. Some of y'all can say thank you. 
Because if you know the Bible, you know that Psalms 119 is what? The longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's 176 verses. And it is a great study. If you had time, we would do it. Maybe one day we will. But I, I want to just show you, when it comes to David, how, how meticulous he was about the Word of God. The longest psalm written, the longest chapter, the longest in the Bible. Listen to what I want you to understand. It is a, listen, it is an acrostic. Anybody, sometimes I use acrostic. Anybody, like when I preach on love and I say L stands for this and O stands for this and V stands for this, it's an acrostic. But now I've never preached 22 points. I've preached some long sermons, but this is a long sermon. See, it, there's 22 sections in this psalm covering eight verses apiece. So every eight verses, it turns into a different chapter or a different song or a different verse, if you want to say it. But now let me tell you something. Not only is it 22 sections with eight verses in each section, which 22 times eight equals 176. So that's 22. Why 22? Well, because remember I said he's doing... An acrostic. And so to do this, he goes and says, I'm going to use every letter from the Hebrew alphabet. Just like we use A, B, C, D, E. David uses every letter from the Hebrew alphabet, all 22 of them, using eight verses on each one. Listen, each section begins with the very next letter of the alphabet. So all eight verses, the very first begins with the, each letter. And listen, all eight verses then begin with the same letter of the alphabet. You're talking about meticulously writing a psalm. All eight verses have one of the 22 each one starts, and if you kind of pull up Psalms today, at Psalms 19, you'll look through, you're like, wow, he's right. Yeah, I, I, every now and then I get that way. 22 verses, all eight, busted into eight verses, and all eight verses all start with the same letter of the alphabet that he's using at that moment. How meticulous is he? Listen to me. Every verse in the chapter contains one or more of the following words. Listen. Law, commandments, precepts, testimonies, judgments, word, statutes, ways, or name. Why, why is he doing this? Why is he becoming so meticulous on this? Listen to me. Because David understood something that many of us do not understand. And I hope that for today, I know I'm, I'm teaching this because this is, a lot of times we, I, I could tell you, you need to read your Bible. How many times the minister, how many times have we ever told somebody, you need to read your Bible? Well, David is using this, this sermon, he's using this song to teach you the value. Listen, God's law represents his ways, his character, and his will. God's laws, David understood, he said, God's law represents his name. It represents his character and it represents his will. Okay, let me put it to you this way. Draw me a picture of God. Draw me a picture of God. What would you draw? What would you draw? A tree? The earth? Maybe the Ten Commandments? Maybe, maybe, maybe. What would you draw if you were trying to describe the DNA, if you were trying to describe God to someone? Because people ask you all the time, well, I've never seen God. 
So you've got to draw a picture of God. Listen to me. What David understood was this, that God's word was a transcript of the Almighty's own soul. If you say, Pastor, draw me a picture of God. That's the picture of God. See, we, we're a bunch of liars. Let's just be honest. We lie about things all the time. Well, I didn't want to hurt their feelings. I didn't want to do that. I, I, I didn't want to get caught. I didn't. We are liars. Therefore, our name has less value. That's why we don't believe people on TV, believe people who, who we talk to, because we live in a world full of liars. I know it may hurt your feelings. But think of the things you tell people all the time that you know, well, that probably ain't what I should have said. I probably should have told them the truth. And then you bump into God. And God says, my name is my word. Therefore, my word establishes my name. David understood this so much so that he understood that to know God was to know his word. To know his word was to know God's heart. To know God, so that when you look at David and said, he's a man after God's own heart, he's a man who's after God, what was David after? His word. He was after his word. Word, because he knew the more I understand about his word, the more I know about him. God says, You want to be like me? Yes, that you yea be yea, nay be nay. It's just real simple. You want to be more like me? Tell the truth. And the easiest way to tell the truth is to know my word. And then when everybody asks you a question, you say, well, the Word of God says. The Word of God says. Shall I tell you, He tells you to, to put it upon your forehead, to bind it on you. To Throughout Scripture, it's constantly telling you, if you know my Word, you know me. So if the enemy says, I'm trying to kill, steal, and destroy you, what would be the one thing, the first thing he would say you don't need? You need your opinion. <laughs> You don't need his opinion. Because if I'm going to kill, steal, and destroy you, then I need you to not have his word. I need you to be able to understand it. Listen, it's God's DNA. It's the picture of God. If you're saying, I want to describe God, God is a spirit. God doesn't have a fleshly body. God is not in that way. But how do we know God? By his word. He said, David said, I can tell there's a God because I look at creation. He spoke it into existence and the stars hang on his word. He said, I walk outside and I know there's a God. Why? Because something's holding it together and it's His Word. In Psalms 119, let me just show you how, how serious David is about this real quick. Let me cover a few of these fish. I, I, I'm not, I do, do not have time to go through all of it. But I'm going to give you the, the gist of what David is saying. And I'm going to just run through these, okay? I'm not going to stop. Good? I'm not going to stop. Verse 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of God. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole... Verse 11. The Word I have hidden in my... that I might not sin against... Verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts. And contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your... Getting the point? Verse 23. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your... Verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So shall I meditate on your wonderful... Verse 28. 
Let your mercies come also on me, O Lord. Your salvation, your salvation according to your... David was a man after God's own heart. What did he understand? If I know his word, I know him. If I believe his word, if I speak his word, if I live his word, then I know him. Verse 41, listen to what it says. Let your mercies come also on me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. Verse 48. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments. Think about that. We praise him because he loves us, right? Oh, praise God, he loves us. He, David said, you know what I'm praising? Your commandments. Love your neighbor. Praise God. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Praise God. Why? Because David understood that if I'm locked into his commandments, if I'm locked into his word, I'm locked into his blessings. Oh, I can take on a giant if I know it's his word. I can defeat any enemy if I know it's his word. Because God, his character is he cannot lie. So if he spoke it, What percent of a chance does it have of of happening? 100% chance. David believed the promises of God completely. Listen to what he says in verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me... Wow. Next one, 65. You have dealt with with me, your servant. O Lord, according to your word. Verse 78. Let the proud be ashamed. For they treated me wrongfully with falsehood. But I will meditate on your... What do you do when people hurt your feelings? Go read your Bible. (laughs) That's what David said. What do you do when somebody hurts your feelings? Go Go read your Bible. Go find you a quiet place and read you about why. Because that's what you met. That's what changes your life. Verse 87. They also made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your. You getting the, you getting the, I'm skipping through a lot of the good stuff too. I'm, I'm just covering just the highlights. How about verse 92? Maybe it changes course. No. Let's keep going. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my... What kept him alive? When David's hiding in caves, when David is pursued by Saul, when David's killed a man, when David's son has died, when da- how does David overcome it? How does David, like unlike a lot of people, keep moving forward? He said, listen, unless your law had been my delight, unless your word had been what I'm trusting in and depending on, I then would have perished in my affliction. Let me tell you why many of you can't make it through problems. You quit reading. You start going through a problem, the first thing you do is quit going to church. You quit reading your Bible. And you wonder why it gets worse. Because the only answer for your life is the Word. Let's go to the next one, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. (laughs) It is my meditation all the day. And if you want to be like David, I'm just telling you how you get there. Verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my... That's one we kind of pull out every now. We like to pull that one out. 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. 147. I rise before the dawning of the morning and I cry for help. I hope in your... I'll tell you something. You want to know God? It's the only way to know Him. It's the only way you're ever going to know Him. You know God to the level you know this. To the level you believe in this, you believe in God. You don't know Him any better. You don't know Him any more. Oh, but I've had emotional moments and I've had experience. Yep. And they went away. 
And you long for him to come back another time so you can feel him again, but, but that's not knowing him. I can walk by and give you a hug when church is over and you say, oh, Pastor Lot gave me a hug today. Oh, it's so awesome. Man, I love Pastor Lot, but you don't know me. Not until we sit down and we start talking and I share my story and I share my life and, I, and you share your life and we just kind of spend time. Why? Because it's in our words where we'll actually know each other. Go ahead and look at the person and say, Pastor, telling you the truth. Verse 161, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your... Verse 170, let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your... 175, let my soul live and it shall praise you and let your judgments help me. David, David understood the concept of, of, of studying, of reading, of... Listen, to trust God's Word means four things. Four things you need. I'll, I'll wrap this up. First thing you have to do to understand or to trust God's Word, you have to hear it. You have to be able to hear it. Some of you can sit in church and not hear it. Your mind's on a million things. Your, 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 your agendas are totally different. You can't hear it. And because of that, you can remember things we were joking a while ago and, and about songs that somebody said they would listen to the 90s and stuff. And they said, it's amazing in the 90s. I was like, and they could still sing those songs and hear those songs. You know why? Because you meditated on those things. And you know why? You heard it. You heard it. And because you heard it, this great computer you got as a brain, it's got it. Imagine if you'd spend that much energy memorizing, learning God. So that when a problem came up, immediately that old tune came up. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That old tune starts playing. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ. If an enemy comes against me one way, he'll have to flee seven ways. It's just like an old tune. It just starts playing all over again. Because why? Because I heard it. Listen, to hear something literally means to watch or perceive or to notice it. It means I have to take intent to watch it, to perceive it, to notice it, to regard with attention so to see or to learn something. Go with me to Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. Listen to what it says. Very important. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence... To the simple and to the young man, knowledge and direct and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in what? And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. I want to show you two things. Where it says, listen, in the beginning, in verse 1, it says, you as a person have to know. Listen, a wise man will hear. Go back to verse 1. Let me show it to you one more time. The Proverbs of Psalm David, verse 2, to know wisdom. The word know there, the word know there means this, to pound it in. You want to know wisdom? Bro, Lot, I wish I could do what you do. I wish I could, you know, let me tell you how I got it. I pounded it in. I pounded it in. In problems that I didn't understand, just Pound it in. When I didn't feel, I pray it over my own body sometimes when, when, when sickness or things would come up and, and it was like, just pray for yourself. I just, you know, lay hands, just get some oil, well, lay hands on yourself. Just say, I believe God's word. I'm believing it. I'm going to, why? Because what are you doing? You're pounding it in. You got, the, the Bible says right there, the proverb says, how am I going to learn God's ways? How am I going to learn wisdom? You pound it in. So how many times do I have to tell you? You ever hear that? How many times I got to tell you? Let me tell you what the answer to that is. Just go ahead and solve it. A bunch. 
So next time you look at your kid and you say, how many times I got to tell you that? Just go ahead. Yep, pastor said I got to tell it to you a bunch. That's why I'm usually giving about 18 years with each kid. You know why? Because I'm giving 18 years to pound it in. And then somebody's like, well, I worry about my kid at 20 and 20. I ain't going now. I done pounded and pounded and pounded. And I'm going to tell you something. I love you, and I, but you're going to have to finally realize that, you know what, it's the truth. I ain't going to sit here at 42 and still trying to pound something into you. Life will take care of it now. I done pounded, I've done lived. My kids can look at you and say, you know, I've never heard my dad go off on a cussing tirade. I've never heard my dad. And, and, and all of that, why are you doing it? Because I'm pounding it. You can have a good life and not live like everybody else. You can, you can have a life with God and, be, and not have to talk like everybody else. You don't have to drink what everybody else drinks. You don't have to smoke what everybody, you don't have to put tattoos all over your body to feel like you're significant. You know what? With God, you are more than a conqueror. With God, and I've just pounded it and pounded it and pounded it. And they may say, I don't want it. That's fine. But you know what? I'm going to keep right on living it in front of you to let you know that God is still God. He's still Lord. He's still reigns. He's still, you go off and try to find you some crazy way. Find you some goofy friends. But I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. One day you're going to come back to your senses like the child, prodigal child when you get tired of eating corn cobs and finally come to your senses and realize my dad had more sense than I realized. How do you do? You pound it in. And you pound it in. Number two, first person's got to be willing to hear it. Then they've got to be willing to possess it. To possess it. To take it or fill up on it. To possess something means to occupy it. To possess it means to to take possession or control. See, lots of people have knowledge. We're a a country that's full of knowledge. Oh, I know. That's one of the craziest things I hear people ever say. I know. Go back with me to Proverbs 1 and 5. I'm going to show you something. I showed you verse 1 and 2, but I want to show you verse 5. To possess it means a lots of people have knowledge, but few ever apply it. Few ever take possession of it. Here's what he says. A wise man. I know. Okay, if you know. Then what am I supposed to do? Well, let's look. A wise man will hear and do what? See, a wise person hears and keeps on hearing. See, what I knew 10 years ago, I don't know now. Just the other day, I've got a, I've got like an iPhone 5, iPhone 6, something like that. I mean, it's, and, and now what I'm running into is my phone won't play my Pandora. It won't play anything. It, it just, it's just, you know... I had free radio. I had all this stuff a year or two ago. And now I gave it to my daughter, and she's looking at it, and she's checking it out. She's a dad. This thing ain't going to upload all this stuff anymore. It's not going to, it's just, it's, it's, it's outdated. You got to have a new phone. Like, nothing done wrong with my phone. No, it won't handle the many megabytes and gigabytes and all this stuff, and it won't, it won't download. I said, well, I'll just delete everything on it and then load what I want. She said, it ain't got enough space. You could delete everything you still couldn't. And I'm thinking, but I know that's a good phone. And she looks at me and says, you need a new phone. Well, see, I look at her and she's doing her thing. And I'm like, you need new friends. And I give her that look, you need some new friends. Just like I need a new phone, you need, you need to continue to grow in what? Knowledge. What you knew when you were 12. I mean, I got, I got, I remember Caitlin when, when she was 10, 11, 12, we had the little pond out front. I'm telling you, it was her and other little girls would come over from church, whatever. They'd be in nothing but bikinis out there in my little boat paddling around. Now these are 10 year old girls. Now let me tell you something. She's 16 now. I don't want her and some of her friend out there in a paddle boat in bikini. See, what I knew when I was 10, because she's going to look at me like, oh, what's wrong? I'm like, that's the problem. You don't know. 
That's, that's the whole problem. That's the problem we're having. You're still here, and you need to be over here. It's humorous, but it's true, guys. A wise man will hear, but he doesn't just say, well, I know. No, he will then increase in, and listen, and a man of understanding, if I know stuff, I understand stuff, what do I do? I just do what I know to do. No, what is a man of, a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. I know what I'm doing. Well, good, and go find you some people that know better. That's, that's how you go forward in life. That's how you grow in life. I, I hear it. I possess it. Number three, I dwell on it. When, I, when I'm talking about the Word of God, I must hear it. I, m- I must possess it, but I also must dwell on it. It means to think about something unceasingly or, or persistent. It means to obsess over it. I have to begin to obsess over the Word of God. To dwell on it, to obsess over it, to think about something persistently. That's why we said to meditate on it day and night. In fact, I'm going to show it to you in just a second. Number four, it means to do it. It means to do it. So not only must I hear it, I must also do it. Not only must I possess it, have it in me, but I must do it. Not only must I dwell on it or think about, well, I know what I should do. No, no, don't think about what you should do. Do it. This is the way the Word of God operates in your life. Let me show it to you in just a, a couple places. Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8. Go there with me. Let me show it to you. This is I showed you the first chapter of Proverbs. And he teaches you to do what? Be wise. Listen to wise. Add the Word of God because he'll tell you in Proverbs, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of all that knowledge that I'm telling you about, all that wisdom, is the fear of the Lord. Well, then Joshua then starts off his journey. Well, how's his journey going to go? Well, he's got to know God. So you can't go any further than you know God. Proverbs says you can't go. It's a fool that says there is no God. If you don't have this mindset, you've lost from the beginning. Joshua is in a situation where, I've got to bleed all these people. I don't know what to do. Listen to what God says. Joshua Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according. Hold on, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. When we look at people and tell them, now you need to be strong and courageous. What do we tell them? You need need to act better, do better. Listen, God does not tell him that. God does not tell him, Joshua, be strong. Suck it up, son. Go do what you're supposed to do. That's not what he does. He says, Joshua, only be strong. Only. Only. Look at the person beside and say, only. The only job you have is to be strong and courageous. What does that mean? That you may observe to do according to all that is in the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. It's the only job you have. The only job I have today in my life is not to pastor all seasons, is not to be uh, Elise Lot's husband, not to be Caitlin Lot's dad. The only job I have to do is to do whatever the Word of God has told me to do. Now in that, I'm told to love Elise as I love my own life, and I am to die for her. I, I am to raise Caitlin in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There are commandments that I'm given, but I don't wake up in the morning like, what do I need to do for Caitlin? I don't think about that. I think about what did God call me to do for him. And if I do what God's called me to do for him, it's going to cover all the problems that I got. Amen? That's good stuff. He says, Joshua, you only got one job. I got to lead all these two million people. No, you don't. I got all this stuff. I got to worry about how people are going to get fed. No, you don't have none of that problem. You only got one job. Just be strong and courageous. I'm trying. How do I do it? Meditate. Observe to do according to what's in my law. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. That you may you want to prosper. Just do what you're supposed to do. Just do what you... Verse 8. Joshua, the book of the law shall not depart from your 
mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. You got to hear it. You got to possess it. You got to dwell on it. You got to do it. Do you get it, Joshua? That you may observe to do according to all the. For then, <clears throat> David knew these scriptures. That's what moved, that's what caused David to be the man after. Why? Because he believed those scriptures. If you just do this, David, I'm giving you the same promise I gave Joshua. Just, just meditate on this, think about this, pray about this, speak this, do it every day of your life. And you know what? Then you will make your, oh, whoa, 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 God's going to bless me. No, no, no. No, no, no. You will have made yourself a blessing. God's blessings are already here. There is not one blessing God is holding back from you right now. The only problem is that many of you can't get it. Because it only comes through His Word. You can't get it because you can't do what His Word says. And because you won't do what His Word says, you can't possess it. It's just sitting there. It's just waiting for you. There are many things that I still want. Places I want to go. But it's not God holding out on me. It's Tim saying, Tim... You'll get there as you grow and trust my word. The more you can trust my word, the more you're going to get there. Because the more you'll know me. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Go to Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Another start of the, before we read any of the Psalms, before we even get started in Psalms, before you get started in Proverbs, before you get started in Joshua, I could go to Timothy where Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, before we get into any doctrine, here's what I need you to know. Meditate on the Word day and night. Doesn't matter which book of the Bible you go to, it's always the same. Here's what Psalm says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is what? That's the first psalm. First verse of the first psalm. Quit talking to people that ain't got no good sense. Quit asking opinions of people that ain't got their life together. Quit asking somebody that ain't got no kids how to raise kids. You don't need a nanny. You don't need Doctor Who. You just need God. And He don't mess up a bit. But His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law He meditates day and night. He shall, listen, here's the promise. I don't, I don't want Him to thank you, well, Pastor Lot told me good. No, no, God told you good. Pastor Lot didn't tell you nothing would happen to you. Don't, don't go, Pastor Lot said it. No, no, no. It's either God said it or nobody said it. And God said, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in its season. The reason we named this church years ago, All Seasons, is because of this understanding. The reason I tell you all the time that, that I, I'm not uh, religious or denominational or any of that, those things are wonderful and good, but let me tell you what I am more than anything. I am scriptural. I will be Bible to the day. You can take any of my sermons, take anything I've ever preached and put it online. I'm not preaching the Clarion Ledger. I'm not preaching what somebody said. I'm not preaching somebody's book from 1903. I'm preaching what came from the Word of God. I'm aligning my words with His words. It's made all the difference in my life. That person will be like a tree planted by living waters. And in his due season, he will do what? He will put forth fruit in that season whose leaf shall not wither and whatever and whatever and whatever he does shall. It's a surprise to me if things don't go good. Is it to you? It's a literal shock to me if things don't go good. Now, some of you came in here today thought, oh, I hope. Oh, I, got, I need God to do something. No, you make your way prosperous. 
You make your own way prosperous. God has given you everything needed. He's not holding out on any of you. The only thing that it requires is you believing Him. And the only way you will ever believe Him is to know Him. And when you do, it puts you in place for your life to explode. And it puts the enemy in a place he can't steal, rob, or kill things in your life. Will you stand? I have enjoyed this series. I hope, I hope you have. We've learned in this series that first I have to trust in God. I have to trust in a God who loves me. He's shown grace and mercy toward me. Then I have to learn to trust in what He's put in me. I have to believe in me. I have to believe He's put good stuff in me. I'm not the best at everything. I don't have to be the best. But I have to believe that what God's put in me is good. And I'm okay. Then I have to believe that all these people, all of you around me, are part of my life and part of my journey. The journey that God has for my life, you're part of it. You're not a burden. You're not a, you're not a, a, a problem. You're a blessing to the journey that I have to take. And hopefully, I'm a blessing to the journey you have to take. Iron sharpening iron. And finally, when all of that is put in place, you ask me, Brother Lot, why do you believe? Because I believe in a God of grace and mercy. I believe God has made good stuff in me. I believe He surrounded me with all the right people. Why do I believe in God? Because I can believe His Word will never fail. I believe it completely. And I've done this for 40-something years now, so I'm not a newbie. This isn't a last-week decision. I've done it long enough, I can look you square in the eyes and I can tell you, my God never fails. If I can find that Scripture, if I can find His Word and He gives me a rhema word, Tim, that's yours. Let me tell you something, I can take on hell with a water gun. Because I will, I will overcome. I feel like David did. I can take on a troop. I feel like a giant ain't no problem. And even people that don't like me and trying to fight against me, father-in-laws and the like, it's okay. I will live to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I hope you get that. You may have to go back and listen to these sermons four or five more, tell your family, sit down and take notes again, do whatever you got to do. But you can't go any further than what you can believe. And I'm a believer. Not like the monkeys song. But I'm a believer in the God version. I believe in God. Will you pray, Father? This morning, I feel your presence as people are making life-changing decisions. Right where they're standing, it's hitting them. The gap between where they are and where they're supposed to be. The gap between the person they are right now and the person you called them to be. Holy Spirit, you're talking to them right now. And their problem is not that you haven't put promises in front of them. It's not that you aren't there walking with them. It's the fact that God, they can't go beyond what they're willing to grow and believe. And my prayer is, is that they would hunger for your word Hunger to spend time with you. God, hunger to be able to be in your presence. Because God, if they will do that, then they will find out the one job that they have in life. To just meditate on your word day and night. And to grow to do everything they hear in that word so that they make their life good. They attach your promises to their life. And miracles take place. Father, I pray that blessing on every person in this room. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Go give that old devil fits.